Welcome to the Digication Scholars Conversation Series. I'm your host, Joan Watson. In this episode, you'll hear part one of my conversation with Dr. LaToya Brackett from University of Puget Sound. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of the Digication Scholars Conversation Series can be found on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. Hi, I'm Joan Watson at Digication, and welcome to Digication Scholars. We're talking today with LaToya Brackett. Dr. Brackett is an assistant professor of African American Studies at uh, University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Like myself, she's a Virginia woman, so (laughs) we didn't even talk about that ahead of time, LaToya, Um, but we can. Uh, I'm very excited to have LaToya with us today. Uh, We came to know LaToya as as we sort of find our other Digication Scholars by stumbling upon really outstanding student portfolios and then wanting to learn more about the faculty that have brought those portfolios to life. So LaToya, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and also for selecting me for such a great recognition because it's not directly my work, it's my students' work which is my work as a professor. So this is even better than what, you know, anybody else could give you for what you, you know, wrote, you know, scholarly book or whatever. So it's pretty, pretty impressive to be able to say that my students created something that made others say, wow, we should talk to that professor. So I'm really happy to be here. And thank right. you. Well, thank you. And, and we're thankful too. I, I wrote to you initially about how grateful I am on a personal level that you have provided your students with so much empowerment to speak their truths and use that space. Um, Of course, it's a public scholarship course, which is amazing that that exists because we all need to know where we can use our voices and how we can use them. Um, And then I read something, and this is gonna kind of lead you to talk a little bit about your story, I think, um, from your website, which is so beautiful. You can go to latoyabracket.com and check it out. It's fantastic. you say in your on your website that most importantly you and I'm going to read so I'm not going to look directly at you but most importantly I work each and every day to ensure that those after me have the tools and knowledge that I wish I had had on my own journey. And so I'm going to then ask you to maybe tell us your journey. Um behind every good educator is a person who's lived a life and has her own sort of thoughts and insights and philosophies. So I'm just dying to learn about you. Well, I am a Virginia girl, born and raised Charlottesville, Virginia, and right. uh, raised by a single mom um, who is had passed passed away in 2018. Oh, so and that's sorry. also prompted me. It's okay. It's also prompted me to create a, um, a scholarship fund in her name. So it's Phyllis Marie Brackett yes. Memorial Scholarship Fund, and it's specific to my high school, which is in Charlottesville, Virginia, and it's for girls like me. And uh, once again, trying to give the resources that I didn't have um, in regards to transitioning from high school to college. So um, my mother, you know, she raised four kids basically on her own. And I was the youngest. There's like a five year gap between me and my um, the brother above me. And uh, I went to I ended up going to a really good school, a really good public school. And I found myself excelling in some of the higher classes and I got support from some really wonderful people. And uh, when I decided to go to college, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to college. My mom had no clue. No one in my family had a clue. I am the first generation college student. And uh, I had some resources, some people from the outside. But, you know, one of the things that ended up hitting me was like, so I got into Cornell. Awesome. I got to visit. Really cool. Really loved it. Best decision I ever made to go there. But how do I get from Charlottesville up to, <laughs> up to Ithaca, New York, which is an eight and a half hour drive? And uh, some of my family members were definitely like, hey, why don't you just stay at UVA right here? And I was like, no, 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 I got to get away. I want to, you know, explore. And honestly, I've been everywhere since then. So I went to Cornell and uh, I found um, specifically Black women and Black men like myself that aspired for this educational purpose that really bonded in certain ways that I wasn't able to find in Charlottesville or at least in the communities that I was in. And um, I, fell in, I fell into Africana Studies because of a summer program we did before um, our freshman year. And I thought I was going to be a sociology major. <laughs> and then I took a sociology class. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to Africana Studies. 
And um, Africana studies is what told me who I was, where I came from, what that looks like and how, you know, teaching about our own cultures can look like and spaces that you can find that are safe and inviting and uh, remind you of your own people, right? But also that you can prosper in the world, wherever you are. And so it's also at that space that someone first ever told me directly, you're a good writer. No one had ever really told me that. I had always been jealous of a lot of the kids in high school that were never told that. And his name was Dr. Don Ohadike. Um, He passed away before I finished my four years there at Cornell. But um, this was over that summer. It was over that summer session in his class, African Civilizations. Um, and uh, we were walking across the bridge. And he said, you know, you write really well. And I said, thank you. And I still have that paper to the, till this day. Oh, and great. so... <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, and then I went to grad school at Michigan State. I was just like, I can't, I, I couldn't see myself getting into a habit of a work environment that wouldn't allow me to, to continue to educate myself and to keep striving for something more. So I went to uh, Michigan State, got a, a PhD in African American African Studies, and also was invited to apply to their counseling program once I was there. So I got a master's in that, which I'm going to tell you is probably the best thing you could ever has a, have as a teacher or professor, because you're counseling 24-7. But it was there that I met my uh, chair and also kind of surrogate grandpa, Dr. Um, Richard Thomas, who's now retired. I was his final graduate student. And he also said that I was probably his best and probably more so his favorite because, you know, but he was at least 70. (laughs) Right, right. He was at least 70. And the way he got to interact with new generations at 70 was something I want to do. And I don't want to miss out on generations. So... I think that that was where I was like, yeah, I'm definitely wanting to be a professor. I will tell you, though, if you asked me in high school what I wanted to be, I'd be like, I don't know. I just don't want to be whatever it is I see most of the time. I just want to be able to make a choice and to love what I do. Now, the trajectory after that, oh, that's all over the place. You know, (laughs) I definitely didn't get a, you know, a tenure track job like a lot of my colleagues do right out. Um, African-American studies is it doesn't have that many options in tenure line um, positions. And, uh, and often it's more opened up to just about people in more traditional fields as well. Whereas an African-American studies scholar is not always able to go into some, to, into some of those traditional fields. So I kind of was stuck, did some nonprofit work for a little bit. And then I got an administrative job out in Eastern Washington. <laughs> I moved from Virginia all the way out to Spokane, Washington, stayed there for a couple of years. And then I dipped out by going to Taiwan and I taught English as a second language. And honestly, talk about joy of little kids and teaching kids that, you know, are four and five. And then the seven, seven year olds, they're, they're perfect. That is like the perfect age for teaching. And then, you know, 13 year olds and stuff. And I found fun in teaching. And I'm going to tell you, that's part of my teaching pedagogy. That makes me such a great professor that I am now. At least that's what the students tell me is probably being able to laugh at yourself (laughs) with little kids being able to um, use a whiteboard nonstop (laughs) to the extent that your arm is hurting, Um, just playing games, creating games and being creative because the kids had to learn English, you know, so you had to keep them going. And that was kind of a after school kind of thing. And, uh, and then I got this job and I jumped right into it. And of course I joined an amazing faculty in African-American studies here at Puget Sound. And then also the race and pedagogy Institute And the Race and Pedagogy Institute, literally the word pedagogy says, you know, how do we teach people about race? And our work is extensive. And I got to jump on board with some really great scholars, teacher scholars. And so uh, they just, they just tell me, go, we'll, we'll, we'll help you out and uh, talk about mentorship, mentorship from those that come after that have been there before me, but also my own colleagues, right? So that's my trajectory to here. And I am the first person to teach public scholarship. So uh, they created it. And then the position that they created for me, well, ended up being for me because I got the position, uh, was to be the first person to teach public scholarship. So they gave me this. This is what we gave the curriculum people. Here you go. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I was like, public scholarship, what, 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 what is this? Okay. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. And, um, then I met with our, um, uh, I think, uh, Renee Houston. And she talked about this thing called ePortfolio. And I was like, okay. Uh, cause that's how we reference it mostly on our campus. If I said education, people are like, what? ePortfolio. <laughs> oh, okay. But 
I was one of those first people to do it. And it was a lot. It was extremely stressful in that first year. And then when we built it into Canvas, I was like, thank the Lord. So <laughs> that's, that's, that gives you all of like my trajectory where I am now. And then it's like a couple years later, they're like, oh, your work is so great. I was like, it is? Okay. Because that was, it was a lot. And um, Elise, um, Elise is really great. When she came on board, it really just solidified the ability to have that resource that you need, templates and things like that. I give props to my first ever class out there. They are out there. And we, we struggled together. We learned together. And then now when I'm in like my third rendition of the class, it's some of the most beautiful work, yeah, that I've ever seen. So it takes a little bit. So that's a, I think that that was actually a pretty succinct kind of timeline for you there. <laughs> I did pretty yeah, good. You see them all over the place. <laughs> but that's great. I mean, all, all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast, and, and there you are now, and you seem very settled where you are. Yeah, I am. I really, I like Tacoma. And so I, I came in as a visiting assistant professor too. So when mm -hmm. I did the original, all the digitization work that I've done thus far has been in an, a, visiting, a visiting position. And now I have a tenure track line that started this year. So this is my fourth year at Puget Sound. So now it's like, okay, we're really in it. This is, this is what public scholarship looks like forever from now on. Uh, it's, but it was really nice for me to go back and just look at some of the ones, because you forget, you know, uh, the work that they do because, you know, come down from, especially this last semester, because we went online, I changed things a little bit. And then I was like, oh, I kind of like that adjustment. Interesting. So I like how it's altered over time. And I appreciate the students for, for doing the work. Now, education is not for everybody. Not every student is extremely excited to do it. And not every student has what it takes to make it look, make it attract people's eyes. And uh, it doesn't have to be over an over amount of anything. It could be very simple and clean. So trying to teach them what creativity, what things should look like is also part of that public scholarship. So I have to like critique their the appearance of things. And I also make them do one version and then the final version. So that means they have to like redo the whole thing instead of just be like, oh, let me just add some more and try to fix this part. So um, I'm a very, I'm very, I'm all about polishing. That's something mm -hmm. our students these days don't really know what how to do. Uh, I'm like, well, why isn't there a title on this? That is the assignment title. That's not the title. I want the title of what the content is. And so I'm all about polishing. And I try my best to to teach students. It's it's that little extra bit. And I um, I think that it also is something my mother probably taught me. It was always to be polished when you're out in the world and engagement. She probably wouldn't have thought that that's what she taught me, but she sure did. Our moms have a way of doing that, don't they? They do. They really do. <laughs> well, I feel like it's um, the whole concept of visual literacy, certainly working in the ePortfolio realm as I do, it's really hard sometimes to get people to, to recognize that their portfolios are being published. And for students also, I think it's a challenge because they're so used to creating an assignment for an audience of one, right? Just the teacher. And now it's there's this whole other thing and there is a little bit of work that goes into it that's why you all are very fortunate as you mentioned to have elise who who makes these lovely templates that they don't have to be modified much in order to have a very clean look but you do want students because i imagine you do some teaching about intertextuality and things like that as well and having the the text that is the visual component of that portfolio what is what are the pictures saying about who you are and what you're trying to get across? So that's I, I feel your pain on that. You're not the only one. It's not just like we have to teach the curriculum anymore. There's so many other components to it. And I wonder, um, it's this is clearly something that you think about. So when I was going through education, my background's educational psychology. And so one of the things that we talked about in you know, with respect to curriculum and developing your pedagogical model is that you kind of sometimes have this hidden message or hidden agenda or hidden pedagogy that you want to make sure your students get across. Uh, and those are usually hinged very succinctly on, on our own life experiences. So do you have any of those sorts of experiences or um, can you peel us behind the curtain and show us some of your hidden pedagogy? <laughs> I've read some of what you've written, so I could probably guess at what they are, but I'm going to let you talk about them. <laughs> so my, my hidden pedagogy, um, I guess it all, it really does go back to that one professor that just gave me a compliment. 
um, that I'd never heard before. Um, being African American, being a, a, wom- a woman, um, kind of always doing well, but never good enough is what I always felt like. I never found a space where teachers were, you know, speaking about my work to the whole class. Um, and I always felt like, oh, and then I got this one time and it wasn't even in a public space. It was even that one-on-one of just confirming like, you're good at this. And he was right. I am pretty good at writing and it comes naturally to me. Um, and so I'm very blessed to have that skill. And so for me, whenever I interact with students, a lot of times it's about affirming what's great, what's good, what they've worked on, what they've advanced, what they've changed and how I see that it's changed and then reminding them and what's next, um, which probably goes back to my counseling degree. So, (laughs) you know, start with some of those, like, you know, you, you're almost there. Right. Um, and then the other thing about, you know, as a, and this is, you know, here's the thing, our, the under, like the underbelly of public scholarship being in African-American studies is the fact that what we present to the world reflects back often, not just on the individual, but our program, the faculty in our program, which speaks to being a marginalized person in our society. You might speak up and then people assume that whatever you said is for everyone that either looks like you, sounds like you, or whatever that might be. And so when we teach African-American studies, they are already aware of something that we speak of, which is positionality, Mm -hmm. how you see from where you can see the world, right? And then you should always be thinking about well, where is someone else going to be seeing you? And what do you need to put on that, that page for them to know who you are and where you're coming from and why you're doing this and the intent without having to just be like, my intention here is this. And the, you know. So when we do a positionality statement, which um, I think a lot of my students di- did have to do when they're about me, um, they have to tell you, this is who I am and I'm doing African-American studies. And what does that mean? Um, and so other things that you know could be difficult to talk about is, okay, so you have to put a picture up. And I say, I need a professional picture. I don't know about you, Joan, but trying to say professional picture to this generation can give you just about anything. And, um, and, and, and it's one of those things where I remind my students because we talk about language, language creation and how um, knowledge creators, because in that, in the specific public scholarship class, we uh, read a book called, is everyone really equal? Um, and in that text, we, there's a whole chapter on who gets to create knowledge. And the reality is, you know, people from a higher Students who are in K-12 that are from a higher income bracket actually believe that they can create knowledge, whereas those who are more impoverished are like, uh, those people, and they tell me what it is. So the fact that public scholarship is like, you create public scholarship all the time. When you are on your Facebook page, when you are on a YouTube channel, when you're on Twitter, when you're on whatever else is out there, because we're in a digital world, this is information you're sharing. We want to make sure it's represented right. So when we say professional image, right, there is this assumption of the dominant culture of what that should be. And I don't want to, I try to tell the students, this is not me putting you in a box. I know you have your individuality. I don't want to tell you that what you, what you present as is not professional, but we are talking about a very specific, specific system. And in this system, professional does not look like that. And so we have to process all of that and be angry at it, but then have to recognize that this is going outward facing. And this is how I always speak about it. What, if it's outward facing, what do you want people to see? And so I say, and so some people, they'll put their picture up at the beginning when they do their about me, it's kind of like a first assignment. And then I have to have sometimes a really candid conversation of, so I need you to change this picture. Um, I hope you can see why. Um, And then sometimes they don't see why. And then I have to be a little bit more gentle and direct about clothing, uh, skin, whatever that is. Right. And, uh, letting them know because this representation is, that's how people are going to see you first. And we can't assume that they're going to see you the way in which you are presenting yourself in that image because we don't, they don't know you. So if no one knows you, how do they see you? You want them to see you in a light that would say, hire me, or you want to learn more from me and those kind of things. And that's something that we really have to teach a little bit more directly now. Um, I also have something called like professionalism grading in my classes, some of them, the upper level ones. And the professionalism isn't just about participating. That's why it's different because professionalism is you turn things in on time. You put effort into the, the thing. You don't just copy. So Elise will put things up there and I'm like, if I see that one of the pictures she put up there is not changed, the placeholders are not changed. I'm taking points off. So it's just that component of, did you put the energy into it? Even if you don't like to do it, you have to do it. 
And I will say that teaching this kind of class, because a lot of the stuff is, did you do it? Because it's a process. It's more about the process, right? Not, not, oh, let's check a box. It's the process is the product. So they, they go through these phases and they're just like, oh, I just want to do this. I'm like, well, you know, what energy did you put into it? So, I mean, there's a lot of layers to it, but I think that being trained as an African-American studies scholar or black studies scholar, as others might also refer to it, um, we, we know that positionality matters and uh, representation matters. And all of our students, no matter what their, their um, background, no matter their racial background, gender, um, ethnicity, language, whatever, there is something you want others to know about you. And there's things that you hope they don't um, in, infer about you. So how can we make sure that that outward facing document says you're, you're, a, you know, a bad, you know what, you know, so, you know, <laughs> and they're like, all right, Dr. Brackett. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, just they, yeah. So that's kind of where it is. And, and just having to have those candid conversations. So the other component is if you don't know your students, well, if they don't respect you, they don't understand that you're coming in with, with energy to make them better. They won't listen to you. So if they just see you as someone that grades and it's just like, oh, this isn't very good. You need to do this better. They might be like, well, what is better for you? Well, they know what better is for me. They know what I'm striving for. And uh, having really great representation from old, like former students is also a really great way to show them. Here's a really extra flowery one that's beautiful. And here's one that's really simple and clean and it's black and white. And it's also beautiful. So find you and, and show us who you are. So that's kind of some of my pedagogy. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And it is, there's a lot of, um, a lot to be said, really, I think, for having that caring, the compassionate aspect to it, because faculty need to tell students things, because how else are they going to learn them, for real? Um, and then the idea of them being able to trust you, and that allows them, and I've seen some of your students' portfolios, it allows them to be vulnerable in ways that are so just courageous and, um, you, you know, erases the hair on the back of your neck. Sometimes when, when you read through some of these portfolios, it's really astonishing. And so how, how do you do that with your student? How do you get them to be brave and vulnerable? And what, what, what do you give them? What is your recipe? Honesty. I mean, I think it's as simple as that. I don't, I am a private person. I do have boundaries because you need boundaries. Students don't know very much about me. I did take, <laughs> I did take 17 students to Ghana last winter. So they know more about me, but they still don't know quite as much about me. Right. Um, and then that's a different bonding and engagement there. But um, I, I, which is also goes back to my counseling degree. I give them, um, uh, what is it? We call it like an accommodation where we reflect on, well, you know, I went through something similar to this and this is what I had to do. Like, this is what happened and this is how I adjusted it. A lot of times with college students, if they're, they're hitting their heads in the wall, like, oh, this is not working. It's like, okay, well, we've been complaining, been complaining about it. So what are we going to try to make it better? Um, but I, you know, I share my story in those spaces. And of course it depends on what level of engagement. So I teach a African-American studies, um, introduction course. I'm not sharing that much about myself in there, you know, and it's a bigger class. A lot of the students might just be passing through to take the class for the requirement for our diversity kind of requirement, at our school. And I may never see them again. Some of them find a uh, one-on-one in their senior year. And they're like, shoot, why haven't I known about this all the time? I was like, I don't know, but you want me to help you figure out how to get an AFAM minor in the last two semester, last semester you have? And they're like, yes. Um, but then it's in this case, um, uh, public scholarship is more specific to the major. It's required for the major. So we usually have like definitely less than 15 people. And so it creates a community and um, something that I was just kind of, told by my students recently because of the because of the online experience we're having is that I know how to make a community online. I was like, "Oh, that's great. How do I do that?" I don't know. But it's it usually happens with upper level students, right? Um students who've been around the block a little bit and they are digging into race work. They really want to talk about it and they want to talk about it with people who want to talk about it and have some skills to talk about it. And so in 399, they have to take ownership at some point to lead discussions. They have to lead the discussions. And I just sit there, just taking notes. And then at the end, I was like, oh, that was good. You know, they have to do that. They have to work together to create something. They have to engage with the Race and Pedagogy Institute. And um, with their vulnerability, you know, if they share something in class, I usually am like, you know, that reminds me of something, right? That I've either seen, engaged with, may not be my reality. 
And um, I often thank them for sharing. I often reflect back on, you know, you know, you didn't have to share that. And a lot of times if students do tell me something in advance, I'll ask them, would you like to share that in class? And I can just, you know, reach out to you in class directly so you can share it. And they will. And I, you'd have, I would say you'd have to ask them though, about what it is that I create. I don't know. I, I think I'm, I think I get that part from my dad. <laughs> He's a very <laughs> friendly dude. Everybody loves him in like two minutes, but, um, you know, uh, one student a couple years ago said that, um, I'm really approached. Well, I think a lot of students are scared of me right off at the beginning, especially in the one-on-one, but students get to know me like she's very approachable. She's really caring, kind, but she doesn't take any, you know what? Uh And so I still have the stern line of, but you're supposed to be learning. I'm not going to just pat your back. And so I don't pat the back for, you know, a visual performative reason. I'm patting your back because I really saw something. And sometimes if they literally say, oh, thanks. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I just said this. Did you hear me? And then that. So I realized that when people didn't give me those affirmations, I'm lucky to have not have needed them to continue working forward. But in that moment, when someone told me that before I even started my four years at Cornell, it changed my whole trajectory. Um, And it's hard sometimes to see students uh, struggling in college because I had such a great experience. And so I want to make, have them have a great experience. And I like that e-portfolio, or at least uh, uh, they ask, what are some of the highlights, which, which portfolios were some that you want to highlight this semester? And I go through and I really think about, it's not just the pretty or how well it looks, but also the people who worked hard and put themselves into it. And that's what I share. Um, but also a lot of our students in this generation, a lot of these youth want want people to hear them. They want them to know their stories. And I am lucky enough to listen to them, learn about them. And then in our spaces, the peers also get to do that too. And public scholarship is completely different than other um, program, other courses because it's more like you're doing something, you're producing something, you are learning the tools, you've already learned, you're learning the tools and then you have to implement them, which it's more practical. And so they're not getting tests. There's no t- a lot of tests. It's about show me what you've learned and showcase that to us and tell me what you've reflected on. And so if they're not willing to do that work, they usually don't do well. This concludes part one of our conversation with LaToya Brackett from University of Puget Sound. To hear part two, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The Digication Scholars Conversation Series is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative e-portfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. This episode was produced by Drew Albanicius. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for watching.